Um, a number of you uh, probably already have login information. There's been a lot of activity by both folks that we've got set up prior, um, as well as uh, uh, different company, different organizational admins going in and getting people set up throughout their site. So there's hopefully some familiarity with the system. Um, if you do not have uh, login information, um, I'm on the dev site right now, uh, so we're not actually working with live data. But on the live site, there's instructions on the login screen on what to do to get set up. Uh, effectively, you'll just reach out to tech services. Uh, tech services will help get uh, at least one admin set up for your company, uh, and then you'll be free to establish roles and responsibilities um, for your organization once that initial role has been identified. Um, the initial time that you're going to log in, you're going to have to go through and set up some initial roles, and that's what we're going to do here. Um, we suggest and highly recommend that each organization have at least two admins. Um, that way one admin can reset password and make changes or, or whatnot on behalf of the other, uh, and, uh, and there's always somebody who has access to the site. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but I'll touch on it here. There's three roles. There's an admin. The, who's a, a, the, the reason that that role exists is to establish access, so defining who within the organization can gain access to which sites that the organization controls. Um, the next level is technician. Technician can do just about anything on the system except define user roles. Um, there has been some questions about that. Uh, for example, if somebody needs to gain access to a specific uh, site to add transmitters or set up a new building, that person doesn't necessarily need to be set up as an admin. They really should be set up as a technician. Um, the uh, last one is a viewer. A viewer is just that. They have view-only privileges. They can use the data, generate out files, but they can't make any changes or additions to information that's on the site. Um, Similar to Tap Watch 3, I think the biggest difference is there may be an inclination to set up a lot of people as admins, um, which uh, you, you probably want to be judicious about who gets to become an admin for a particular organization. You really just want a handful of people with those responsibilities. Um, everybody else that needs site-specific access can be a technician or viewer. Um, a couple things to note here, too. Um, if multiple people are in the site, um, admin and technicians, um, they can be making changes to, to some information. The site is going to, or the system is going to recognize the last change that was made. Um, so multiple people can be in there at any given point in time. It's just going to default to the last one. Um, uh, importantly, with the application, uh, there's no uh, software to download or manage or maintain. This is a cloud-based system as opposed to PC-based. Um, equally important, TapWatch 3 and the, the cloud-based application can operate concurrently. As you're getting up to speed, you can be looking at information from a specific site, and as long as it's got an IP-connected RDL, you can see that information in TapWatch 3. You can also see it in the, in the cloud-based application. Um, the last point to make is this greatly streamlines uh, reliance on, on keys. Um, if you want to get access to a site, again, as an admin, you'll have the ability to do that not only for yourself but for other people within your organization. Um, that was something that we heard pretty loud and clear as we were leading up to the development and launch of this thing. Um, and uh, I'll run through with you how we're going to manage that. Uh, questions on that preamble? All right, let's dig right in. Um, we're going to start by, uh, by logging in. Um, you're going to enter uh, your email and your password. Again, if you don't have a login yet, contact Tech Services. Um, a couple things to note, uh, areas that show up as blue require input. Um, areas that show up as red mean you skip them and you need to go back and provide input. So let me get rid of my password here. So that's red telling me I need to enter data, and then I can log in. That first time you log in, you're going to go to the access portion of your site. Um, it's really all tap watch, it's just the term access is how we uh, delineate, delineated between establishing roles and responsibilities and actually using the application. 
Um, so you're going to log in. You're going to see your company name here to Dallas Zoo property. This is all uh, fake data that we put in here for testing purposes and for uh, training and demonstration purposes. Um, you're going to see uh, your uh, your properties over here on. Oh, I'm sorry. I need to get to the right place. Access. Yeah. So here's your company name, and then here are all the folks within your organization that are authorized users on the site. You're going to know where you are on the site by looking in the upper right. So right now you're uh, you're in, you're in the administ you're an administrator and you're in the uh, user access area of the site for the Dallas Zoo property. And again, the users are listed here on the side. Uh, there's a couple of different icons associated with each user. Star denotes they're an administrator. As you mouse over things, you're going to get little prompts to, to tell you what that means. A little hard hat is a technician. If there's nothing, they're just a viewer. And that mouse over command is consistent throughout the site. So it tells me the admin can assign roles. Janet Jackson, that's who I'm, I'm logged in on. As that, that's how I would view my, my, uh, my uh, uh, profile information. If I click on a user, in this case I'm going to pick Dave Mason, He's music fans who set this up for us. A um, couple of things to note here. So Dave Mason has access to two Dallas Village, that single property for a very specific time period. December 31st, 2016, December 31st, 2021. Um, you can make those time periods whatever you want them to be. It could be uh, you know, a, a month, it could be a week, it could be several days. Um, if you want that person to have unlimited access, you simply leave those dates blank. You don't have to fill anything in. Um, you can also grant people all site access. So if I wanted Dave to have access to every site within my portfolio, I click this all site and it grants him all site access. You notice now that when I click on it, nothing appears because he has access to everything within our portfolio, not a, not a certain number of properties. <clears throat> Questions on that? All right, moving on. Um, throughout the site, anything that you can do, any command is going to show up in green, whether it's a button like add user, <coughs> or remove change roles in the case of you know, if I click on actual rows. Um, one of the things I want to note here is that one particular user can show up in multiple organizations. So say there's a, a, a company you use to assist with installations. Maybe a contact from that company also supports installations for another RBC. They don't have to log in as two separate users. They're going to log in with a single uh, login, set of login credentials but through the admin <coughs> access roles, they'll be able to access multiple sites. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. And, that, and then that was something that came through loud and clear to make it easier to do things like site, site takeover or have somebody come in and perform maintenance on a, on a short-term basis, um, again, eliminating the need for the, for the keys, which is a point that uh, Mikkel wanted me to keep stressing. There's no more need for keys. Um, now, let's go back to our friend Dave. Actually, let's go to Ella Goulding. So I have a question. Sure. If they've added, someone has added me to their site via the cloud, but I want to now work on my desktop, will I still have access to the same sites if I didn't get the key? So if they've added you to the TapWatch application, but they haven't done so in TapWatch 3 via the keys. Um, no, you will not. There will be two separate instances. So I'll have to know which way I have each property in order to access it or Correct. fully transition over to the cloud. Correct, yeah. And, and ultimately the, the, the intent would be to, to have everybody fully transi transition to the cloud-based application. But yeah, that, that's correct. Um, yeah, they would have to go in and change your permissions in the application for you to see it in the cloud. Okay. Good question. Um, so let's look at Elton John. Say we want to give him access to a new site. I simply click this Add Access button. 
and you're going to get prompted with a list of pull downs or a pull down of the different properties within that uh, portfolio. So let's say we want to give them access to the Dallas Zoo homes. And again, I'm going to enter a date range here if I want to, or I can just leave it blank, and they're going to have access. And then it shows up, and it shows up as unrestricted, meaning that they have access to the site kind of for now and evermore. Um, as alluded to, the green commands let you change, remove. Um, this is pretty important. Uh, one click remove. You can do that um, not only at a site level, but you can also do it at a, at a user level. So say there's a maintenance company that you stop working with. You can, you can remove them at this level without having to go property by property, or somebody leaves your organization or retires or what have you. Uh, so one click remove. So now we've added our access. Um, one other thing to note here, all of the pop-ups, um, I, I, we know I, I came in uh, on Tap Watch 3 when this was still a problem. Uh, there was a lot of those hidden pop-up windows. Uh, in this application, everything is going to appear above the, um, the web browser window. So there's going to be no, no hidden windows in the cloud-based application. Now let's see we want to add a user. And I'm going to click that green button. I'm going to type in an email. I'll just grab mine. And now I can select a role. So viewer, technician, administrator. I covered these a bit earlier. Um, any questions on those three different layers of roles? No. No. So I'm going to say I'm a viewer only, or this person is a viewer only. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add that user. Um, this, the current way we're doing this is it's going to, is it going to generate a, a, a landing page. You'll copy and paste this into an email to that new user, and then they'll be able, be able to log in and complete their uh, registration. Um, in a future iteration, we'll be able to have this set up so that it automatically generates an email from the application and you don't have to do that copy and paste step. Um, but this is how it's done, how it's done originally. Um, I'm going to abandon that. And again, please stop if you have any questions. So that, that, the last thing to cover here, and I alluded to it earlier, um, so if you want to make changes to your profile, uh, you simply click on the profile link and it's going to let you change your password or edit the profile. Um, there's going to be instances where somebody forgets their password, needs to reset it. Um, we're working on pushing that functionality out live to the system right now. Um, worst comes to worst, uh, the, what you can do is just remove the user and re-add them. Um, but in a, in a fairly rat short period of time, you'll be able to uh, modify, uh, change, reset passwords as the admin role, as will uh, uh, folks at Innovonics. You'll be able to contact us and we can, we can, we can do that as well. So that covers the... Sure, go ahead. I have a question. Um, huh? Is there a way to add a like users to multiple sites instead of having to go through each site and adding a user? Right now it's going to be either all sites or, or one at a time. Or one at a time? Okay. Yeah, so, you, so the, the ask would be to be able to, to create a user and maybe add multiple sites as you're adding them to, so instead of selecting one of that pull down, you could select more than one? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. We'll make note of that. Who was that that was speaking? Oh, it's uh, Vince. Okay, thank you, Vince. Yeah. All right, so now let's go into the application piece of this. <coughs> So once you've, once you've logged in and you've set up your roles, uh, from that point forward when you log into the site, you're going you're gonna to get this view. This is the portfolio view that you're going to start with. If you want to go back to access, you've got a, a quick link right here, and it's going to open it up in a, in a second window. Um, it's not going, to, not going to boot you out of the application. It's just going to open up a second window. Similarly to what you saw in, um, 
the uh, access side, everything in green is a command. Um, from here, I can add a site. I can generate a read for all the sites. I'll come back to that later. Um, but right now, let's assume that we're adding a new site to the, uh, to the portfolio. Click Add Site. We're going to give this a name. Call it 7 Dallas Zoo Green. The site code is uh, for you all to define, but it's kind of a unique, uh, unique code for that specific property. Um, in our case, we're going to do two D Z G. Um, like the time zone. Let's say these guys are in Hawaii. They're living large. Um, the notes field is optional. Um, uh, ac actually adds his address and time zone. Um, notes would be anything you want to put in here about the site. Um, really up to you to how to how to use that. Uh, character limit is about four thousand. Um, so there's plenty of room in there to to, to do some stuff. Um, one of the things that has come up is uh, maintenance logs. Uh, we will, at a, and again, in a future release, we'll probably give the ability to um, keep maintenance logs at a, at a site level. Um, for now, you can certainly use the notes field for that if you like. So I'm going to click Add Site. Tells me it's added successfully. I can close that out, and now it shows up. Clicking on it collapses it. Clicking on it again expands some information. Um, a couple of other things that we're working on right now is to uh, be able to provide count information, things like um, how many transmitters, how many repeaters, um, and you'll be able to see that at this uh, kind of overview level. Uh, so if you have any feedback on, on additional information you might want to see at this portfolio view, uh, please let us know and we'll, we'll add that into the hopper. Um, so now that I've got this set up, Oh, and uh, site code is uh, serves a similar function to what you're used to in TapWatch 3 in the property code, just a, a little bit of a different um, nomenclature. All right, so I've got this site added. Now I need to set it up. So I click the setup link. Again, a little little prompt command: configure the settings for the site. And it's going to say there's no buildings for this site. Click plus to begin, which I'll do, and that will let me start to add buildings. Let's just say this is building one. And here too, you can use the note fields if you want. Anything with an asterisk is required. As I mentioned earlier, so you see this shift field shows up in blue. It means it's awaiting information, but I can click add building. If it was required, like if I didn't put this in here and I tried to proceed, it would say you can't do that. You get a little red don't go arrow or a little circle with a line through it. Tells me to fill that in. Building one, add building. That is successfully. Now it shows up. So we've, we've created that building. <clears throat> the next step is going to be to add a unit. There are no units in this building. Click add unit to begin. Okay, let's do that. So I enter unit name, which is generally going to be the apartment number. Again, plus gives me a pull down with everything that's going to be required for that uh, for that property, starting with utility type. Let's say this is water all, CXID. Ten digit number. You're going to get off the transmitter. Um, I'm going to cover how to set up a, a brand new site using the export and import functions in a minute, but this would be how you would, if you were swapping a transmitter out or something like that, um, or getting something initially set up. 1501, meter model, spam, uh, meter serial number and initial meter count are optional. Um, at this stage, you probably don't have access to the initial meter count. You may or may not have access to the serial number. You can certainly go back and add those later. Um, we suggest you do at least do the, uh, the meter count because that's going to help uh, with accuracy going forward, but it's entirely up to you. Uh, count factor will default based on the, the meter that's selected. Again, the note field is optional, and I'm going to add the unit. From here, I can either add another unit or I can close it out. It's telling me this was successfully added. I'm going to go ahead and close it out. 
And there you see it shows up, Unit 201, there's the TXID, the initial meter count we have not entered, so it's zero, the meter type, what transmitter's in there, count factor, what it's being used for. Um, you can have multiple transmitters in an apartment of, in a unit, just like you, did, you can do today. So if you have one for hot, one for cold, uh, what have you, um, really up to you how you want to set that up. Uh, something new that we want to point out here is flow. Uh, so if I hover over that, it says start the flow test process. Um, what that is is a way to confirm that the transmitter you're setting up is functioning. Um, what you'll do is you'll put the transmitter in rapid transmit mode. It'll expire after about 10 minutes. Um, the system is going to wait for as many pulse counts as you input. You can say one, you can say more than one. It's really up to you. Um, and then when you start the test, it's going to give you confirmation that that uh, uh, PMT uh, meter combination are reporting information into the system. In this case, because it's test data, if I left this open, it would eventually um, uh, time out and there would be a timeout error. Um, but uh, I'm just going to go ahead and close that out. But if it was working and you, you did have it in rapid transmit mode, um, you would get confirmation that, that, there was, that there was flow received. Questions on that? Nope. Yeah, that was a, we thought that was a nice thing to add. Now, if all you're doing is, as I mentioned, setting up a single, you know, adding a single transmitter to an existing property or, um, you know, swapping one out, something like that, you're pretty much done. Um, if instead, uh, what's going to be more likely the case, you need to set up an entirely new site with new transmitters, um, let me run, you how you're, run through how you're going to do that using the export and import functions. Uh, first step is to go back to the portfolio view. So Dallas Zoo Green is the one I just added a transmitter to. Um, I'm going to go to the export function, and that's going to let me export the data. I'm going to close that out. I'm going to open that up my downloads folder. Now I've, I've kind of preset this one to speed things along, but if we had initially downloaded it, the one that we initially downloaded, all of this information wouldn't be there. So what we would do would be we use this as a template to build out the property um, using copy and paste and autofill. So in this case, we're going to copy and paste the building down to all these different fields. I'm going to use autofill to create, in this case, 32 different units. Um, anything with a star is a required field. Um, I'm going to copy and paste the count factor down. Copy and paste the meter model down, copy and paste the um, uh, meter type down, and then um, the transmitter model, copy and paste that as well. Uh, the TXID, I think some customers are using, it, using this, others are not. Um, on the bulk pack, we have the ability to, using those, uh, the TXID labels on the transmitter case, use a barcode scanner to uh, download that, all of those TXIDs into a file and then you can simply copy and paste that into this document. So once that's all done, there's a few different tabs in here too. Actually, let me cover that. Uh, so site gateway, that gives you information about the site. Buildings, gives you information about the um, building itself. Building name and, and unit name. This is going to populate based on what we put in this meters and transmitters field column, or uh, spreadsheet rather, and then finally repeaters. You can use this, this process to import uh, repeater information as well if you want. Um, however, if you've got, you know, three, five, seven repeaters, it might be just as easy to do it within the application. I'm going to save that file, and now I'm going to use the import command to pull it in. Now, 
telling me it was done successfully. We can close that out. We'll go back to setup. And now we see all the units added. If I click on that, you see the specifics about the units. Um, the, again, if you want to go back in and add additional detail, you can use the edit command, fill in these fields that may not otherwise have information. Um, or, as I said, you could, you could use that export-import capability to um, uh, add this additional data to. Does that make sense? Yes. Seem pretty straightforward? Yeah. We wanted to, wanted to try to make this as easy as possible, knowing how long it takes to set up some of these sites. So um, as you get familiar with the system and you have uh, thoughts or suggestions that might help speed that process along, please, please let us know, and um, we'll, uh, we'll add that into our, into our mix. Um, Now that we've got that piece of it set up, the next thing to do is going to be set up the gateways and repeaters. So for that, I'm going to go to this network tab. Again, you're going to get a little bubble that tells you where you are. Uh, a very similar process, you're going to just use the add repeater and add gateway buttons. In this case, using a 5040, my ID. If you want, you can put a location here uh, and notes. Location, you can get as granular as you like. You can put a lat long in there, um, you know, uh, directions, whatever, whatever the case might be. Um, similarly with notes, um, go ahead and add that. And from here, I can continue to add or I can close it out. I'm just going to close it out. So now it shows up. I can edit it. And if I want to, I can remove it. Next, we're going to add a gateway. Um, in this case, it's going to be a 7580, which is the new TapWatch gateway we just launched. Um, within the, uh, and you all haven't had a chance to really play with that yet, but you will in the not too distant future. Um, within each 7580 is an authorization code. That authorization code is going to link that piece of hardware with this specific site. It's unique to that, that certain piece of hardware, and it's an eight digit alphanumeric I'm going to enter that, and I'm going to try to continue. And it's going to say you can't. That doesn't. That's not a gateway that exists. Um, so that was a very purposeful move on our part to make sure that only actual hardware that, that is out there in the field can get associated with a specific site. Um, a gateway can only be associated with one site. Um, so you're not going to have confusion between a couple of different pieces of hardware. Make sense? And the, the install lid itself gives details on where to find that code. It's on the board, uh, kind of lower right-hand corner. Um, uh, for security purposes, we wanted to make it not readily accessible on the outside of the board, but it's going to be uh, on the inside, and you're going to have to open it up to find it. Thought being, if you're configuring a your site, you're going to have that, uh, that, that cover off initially to, to begin with to get it set up. So now let me go back to portfolio, and we'll talk a little bit more about reads. So again, I can use this reads all, which is going to give me the opportunity to generate reads for all of the properties within the portfolio. These File types are the same as you're used to seeing in TapWatch 3. We also added a new one called, new one called JSON, um, but uh, it should be a very similar process to what you're used to today. Um, you're going to enter it. It's going to default to the current date. You can enter a date, and it'll go from that date to 30 days prior. Um, within the application, there's six months of data um, in short-term memory. Uh, uh, or maybe I said that wrong, but you can access that very quickly. Um, to get things that are older, the information that's older than six months, it's accessible, but it's going to take a little bit longer to get. And I'm talking the difference between seconds and minutes. So it's not a, you know, a day's worth of, of endeavor. Uh, it's still fairly immediate. And then if I wanted to generate that read, I just click download, uh, download reads from here. 
Now, if I just want to do it for a specific property, I'm just going to go to that property, and I'm going to click Reads, and it's going to be a very similar process. In this case, let's just go ahead and do it. So that's to manually pull a read? That's to manually pull a read. Are we going to have the option of scheduler like in TAP 3? Uh, yes. Um, okay. And that will be accommodated through, through APIs, um, which is a little bit of a different, a different training. Okay. And who, who is that? And I can make note of making sure to cover that with you. It's Hammy at Delta. Okay. Um, so the reads data, this should look very familiar. I just did the CSV file so we could see it. Um, but everything that you're used to seeing will be visible here. Um, to your question, Tammy, uh, the, the thought is you can, you can you know, pull reads manually if you want. Um, if you want to you know, generate one on demand for a maintenance call or what have you, you, you can do that right here from the application. Um, for those of you that want to do something on a more programmatic scheduling basis, um, we can get you up to speed on the APIs. Perfect. Um, I wanted to ask something. Uh, now that we're talking about the APIs, is there a specific um, language that we should know when it comes to IPIs? Because I was going through the, um, like the introduction, and I saw mm -hmm. some codification language that I don't know if everybody should be, you know, savvy on that. Yeah, it's really the the programming language of your choice is the one you should use. Um, okay. the, the way we structured it, and again, that's a, a little bit of a different uh, training out of the scope, so outside of the scope of this one. We can follow up with you later. Um, but the, uh, the way we set it up is you'll be able to um, use those APIs in just about every single programming language you can imagine. Um, there is a deck on the TapWatch training site that we just pushed out um, mm -hmm. that runs through that. Uh, maybe give, give that a look. Um, and uh, feel free to, to, to follow the steps that are outlined in that training deck, um, and we can work with you to get you set up on the APIs. Okay, thank you. I'm good? Great. Um, I think we, we have examples for, for Python and, and C Sharp. Um, uh, so, you know, the training deck actually has an example on the Python. Yeah. But we also have a sample on C Sharp. Yeah, yeah and if, if there's a specific language you're interested in, we could we could probably generate an example too. And when we say example, it's to the point that really all you need to do is change the um, credentials, uh, and then you'd be able to use that 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 code um, within your application. Um, the, the the benefits of the APIs, and again, it's a bit outside of the scope of this call, but the beauty of that is you're able to use TapWatch for administrative purposes, and then in terms of streamlining the billing process, you're going to use the APIs to pull data directly from the Enabonics cloud um, and, and load those directly into your billing application. So TapWatch becomes really an administrative tool, um, whereas the, uh, the, 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 the generation of reads is something that happens automatically based on the schedule, um, you know, like uh, Windows scheduler or whatever scheduler application you might want to use. Um, pretty, pretty powerful tool and, and fairly fairly easy to use. And there's no, like, there's no built-in schedule within this application. Yeah. It has to be scheduled through there. Are several windows or other tools available yeah. that can exercise the small APIs for scheduling. Right? Pretty easy to work with. Um, the other piece I want to point out is reports. Um, if we click on this, you're going to get a view that's very similar to what you're used to seeing in TapWatch 3 in the check-in monitor. Um, in this case, again, this is testing data, so it's, uh, it's reporting all the transmitters and repeaters and whatnot um, as, uh, as inactive. Um, but, you know, if this were an actual site, you, you would see status, you would see when it was last heard from, count, signal level, signal margin, everything that you're comfortable with and familiar with within, within TapWatch 3. Um, so this is a good snapshot view of what's going on with the site. Um, can assist with uh, diagnostic uh, efforts to make sure that uh, signal strength and margin are, are, are strong enough that those messages are being heard. Um, and again, these are these are red and Z's because these are not uh, actually active on the 
system right now. I Something have a question I when it comes out. to the devices. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, on my side, I have a couple of um, units that have a little bell, and it says that those are tampered. Is mm -hmm. the does the app have has any kind of alert system in which we can rely on when it comes to maybe leaks or something like that? Yeah. So a couple things that we're working on right now is that that notification layer. Um, mm -hmm. So if there is some type of an alarm uh, that you would be able to, uh, in theory, generate an email or a text message uh, to somebody to have them manage that. Um, mm -hmm. Something else that we're working on, which is not live yet. Um, okay. But is, we do have some beta APIs available. Is uh, we leak leak detection is um, it's a the what we're presenting is excessive flow uh, or abnormal flow. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, there might be a a, 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 a meter that's not functioning properly, um, or it's become disconnected from the transmitter. In that case, you're going to see no flow, um, which is okay. just as important as seeing too much. Flow. Yeah. Um, so we'd be able to report on that, um, you know, or the flip side, if, if there is a leak, uh, you know, there's there's flow reported in uh, uh, a certain percentage of the 15-minute uh, check-in intervals throughout a day. Um, mm -hmm. Look for that in a that as well as the larger notification uh, capabilities in a future release. Um, and when I say future releases, at this point, we're on a pace to to be sending upgrades out to the site, both kind of mm -hmm. real time. Uh, as well as larger updates on a monthly basis. Um, on, the, on a monthly basis, we'll be providing information to customers about what we've changed and what's now available. So uh, keep an eye out for, for that in a future release. But on, on the status reports, um, you, know, you can see the ones which have had tampers and all. Yeah. But it's not a, it's, it's more a pull as opposed to a push. Yeah, and that will show up in that the status. For the status, yeah, the status will tell you which are been tampered. Something else that we want to point out. Um, I wanted to ask something really quick. Now that we're checking sure. uh, reports and sites, they all already built up. Um, are we going to be able to modify the information? From for the count, like let's say IMCs or counts. Yeah. So, and I'm gonna I'm gonna cover that actually right now. Um, okay. okay. So, what we've what we've done and what we're in the process of doing is all of the IP connected RDLs that are out there, we are mm -hmm. syncing with with the cloud. Um, a good number of them are there now, um, but there's you know several thousand out in the field. So we're we're we're, we're getting those up and running. Um, so you should be able to see actual read data. Um, for those IP-connected RDL sites, um, you're going to be able to generate reads from the application. Uh, for now, you're going to have to do any editing to that site within TapWatch 3. Again, that's something that a capability that be able to support those RDL properties in the application will be something that will be, uh, be coming along fairly shortly. Um, okay. For any new site you deploy that's using an RDL, um, uh, just contact tech services and provide the serial number, and we'll make sure to get that to get that set up. If it's a new site with the gateway, you'll be able to use that authorization code um, uh, uh, process that I talked about a second ago. Um, and again, TapWatch 3 and the TapWatch application uh, can operate concurrently. So the, well, we, we, that was a very purposeful move on our part. We have no intention of getting rid of TapWatch 3 uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, give you all the chance to get comfortable with the new application so that you can either migrate a portion of your properties and do that over time or if you want to do a, a flash cut at some point in time, but that, that timing is really up to you all to decide. Um, the only gating factor there is if you start to deploy or when you start to deploy the TapWatch gateways, um, those have to work with the TapWatch application. For legacy sites, you can continue to use um, can use TapWatch 3. Any other questions on that? 
All right. Well, I, that that covers the ground that we were hoping to cover. I, I appreciate the questions. I I hope that uh, that gave you a better view of the system. Um, mm -hmm. As you get in and play with it, if you have questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, I think most of you have my contact information from the customer notices that go out the door. Um, if you don't, tech services can certainly get get me in touch with you. Um, and we have an army of people here ready to assist um, as you're uh, working to get up to speed on the new application uh, as well as the new gateway. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank great. you. Thank you all for your time. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.